All right, so uh, I am going to just talk a few minutes each on each of these topics. I'm going to just talk about some of the challenges of picking an optimal frontline regimen for advanced kidney cancer. And then I'm going to sort of just throw a couple of slides up from Tony Schwery's presentation at ASCO uh, in the, uh, the adjuvant data, which, by the way, will be published in the New England Journal of Medicine this week, so you can look for that. So this is uh, the four major trials up front. Um, Ipinevo, Pemaxi, Ka um, Pemaxi, uh, Cabonevo, and Len Vatten and Pembrolizumab. Uh, the clear data, of course, is not regulatorily approved. So the challenges about picking an optimal frontline regimen are um, as follows. Uh, there is no comparative data. There will be no comparative data. So some of the things that I think about uh, as somebody who's taken care of kidney cancer for a long time is uh, a couple of things. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which had been a standard of care from around 2004 until uh, Ipinevo was approved. Anybody who takes care of this disease recognizes that TKIs ground human beings into the ground, slowly, inexorably. They're toxic drugs, they're challenging, they impact on quality of life. The fundamental concept of a treatment-free interval is something that those of us who take care of kidney cancer are looking forward to, the ability to get benefit and stop treatment. So when you think about the therapies that we have available to us today, Ipinevo is uh, the data furthest out, five-year median follow-up. There is a shoulder on the survival curve. Ipinevo is challenging for the first couple of months, but the last, say, you know, 20 months or so is maintenance nivolumab. As a single agent, it is very well tolerated. You get out to two years with stable or disease or better, and we stop treatment. More than half of the patients who get out to two years and whom you stop treatment don't seem to relapse. They may not be cured, but they're not progressing and they're not dying of the disease, and they're off treatment. There is no equivalent with a TKI immune checkpoint. Those therapies, at least the way they're designed, the TKIs go on forever. Now, do we know that? We don't, but that's the way the trials were designed. So is there an optimal regimen? There's not an optimal regimen. If you look, I put this data up, not so that you can compare them, but the reality is when you just take a high-level look, nothing really looks a whole lot different. These are active regimens. They move the needle. It's progress compared to TKIs alone. But in general, many academic GU medonks who treat this disease, if you ask them what regimen they use, they use Epinevo for the most part entirely for the reasons that I've just described. So or how are we going to get to uh, figure out which of these regimens are the, the best? We're not going to figure out which of these regimens are the best. There's not going to be comparative data. There will be some evolutionary changes. Um, hopefully at some point we will have the ability to predict who's going to respond better to certain therapies. But if you ask me, do I think five years from now we're going to be giving TKIs to people? God, I hope not. I mean, that would suggest that we really haven't made any progress at all. All right, so that's all we know about frontline therapy. So what's going to perturb this? Well, this may. So this is, again, from Tony Schwery's ASCO plenary presentation, a keynote 564. Very well done, large randomized trial. Eligibility, I'll show you the uh, patients who were enrolled in just a second. But the randomization was one-to-one, -one, and this is important because, as many of you know, there is another adjuvant uh, trial that is sitting out there. Uh, this trial is pembrolizumab, week Q3 for a year, and you stop, versus placebo for a year, which is very important given this is an investigator-assessed trial. These are the eligibility criteria. Uh, I would argue uh, the high-risk group in the M1 NED doesn't need any clarification. That group of patients has anywhere from a 60 to 100 percent chance of systemic failure. The intermediate to high-risk group is at least 50 percent progressors. The trial was made up of uh, more than half of the patients were intermediate and high-risk, so relatively lower risk than the two higher-risk groups. This is the disease-free survival by investigator in uh, ITT population. 32% reduction in uh, recurrence or death favoring adjuvant pembrolizumab. And you see the landmarks at 12 and 24 months. This is an immature overall survival population. 
However, when you look at this, uh, you certainly get a sense that there is an interesting trend that uh, is worthy of follow-up, given the fact that that hazard ratio is 0 0.54. So immature for overall survival, unequivocal improvement in disease-free survival. All right, this is my last slide. Uh, kidney cancer challenges. So what's the optimal frontline regimen? Uh, I would argue that for those patients who can get um, a IO-based regimen, certainly for patients with IMDC intermediate or poor risk, ipinevo, I think, is the standard of care. Other therapies are reasonable. Uh, my colleague Tom Powells from the UK, uh, when asked the same question, basically says, I don't know what the right answer is, but use one regimen, figure out how to give it, know what the toxicities are, and do it well. I don't think that's a wrong answer. Uh, what happens if as the trial that I just showed you matures and as the FDA looks at the package with regards to the label for pembrolizumab, what happens because of the unmet need if the label is broadened and immune adjuvant checkpoint becomes a standard of care? So there's going to be disruption to the frontline paradigm, right? The issue is going to be, do you recur during that first year while you're on adjuvant therapy, or are you going to get another IO-based regimen if you blow through therapy? What happens if you progress six months later after you complete a year? What does all that mean? We don't know the answer to that. Um, Dr. Petrolak and I are old GU medical oncologists. We were both around, and he, his nose was in the midst of the development of platinum-based regimens, MVAC. We had to figure out what happens when people sort of got recurrences in the perioperative setting or shortly thereafter, or were they platinum resistant? All right, this is another challenge. Good problem to have if, if adjuvant therapy moves the needle. Uh, we're going to have to do other trials. We're going to have to figure out how to develop therapeutics that work in immune checkpoint resistance. We don't have those yet. There are lots of agents that are in the pipeline and are studies ongoing. Um, because ultimately, that's what's going to move the needle. If you perturb a frontline setting, define immune checkpoint resistance, and then have therapies that can then offer therapeutic options when you move uh, into that setting, then that's going to be the change. So kidney cancer uh, in 2021 is sort of in evolution. We're, we're a little stuck in the front line. Um, there are, of course, other frontline regimens being tested. For the most part, if you have an immune checkpoint, you just feel compelled to do a randomized trial. I don't think we need more than three IOTKI regimens, but there are other trials going. So with that, I will stop.